All right, it's a great pleasure to be joined by 14-year NBA veteran, longtime NBA analyst, the great John Barry, joining us uh, just moments before he's about to take some money from Chandler Parsons on the golf course. Look at you. You look like you're about to play uh, in the Masters. I think you're actually rocking Masters gear as we speak. Well, we can only hope I take his money. His handicap is a little bit, uh, a little bit too low or too okay. high, excuse me, too high. Uh, but we'll see. We're out here at Sherwood in L.A., and uh, I play with them almost every day, so we'll have some fun. It's great great to be out there. Every day you play? Uh, every day that ends in Y. Wow, okay. Well done. Uh, I, I was going to ask you uh, off the top before I knew that you were coming to us from the golf course. Um, you know, I, I feel like uh, you were a fixture. I, I used to see you on TV all the time, listen to you on the radio all the time, but you've taken a bit of a step back from the limelight. Conscious decision on your part? Yeah, uh, so I finished with radio two years ago. Uh, so I did 14 years I played, and I did 14 years of broadcasting. Uh, and as I look back, basically 51 years of my life, I was involved in the NBA. Because when I was born, my dad was in the NBA. Uh, and then it was all NBA. So um, I got away from it, and it's fine, you know. And I, and I thought that I would not watch, but I find myself watching and reading and doing all the same stuff that I did uh, when I was working, it's obviously something that's been a part of my life, and uh, it's something that I, I dearly miss. I've I, I got to be honest. I, I, I love the game. I love the competition. I uh, love a lot of people that I got to work with and be around, and uh, I do miss that, but it's been fun to uh, get on the other side, too. And so when you say miss, do you mean miss the playing or miss the broadcasting? I miss both. I, I miss the checks when I played, sure, mostly. Sure. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, both, you know, uh, uh, playing was the ultimate, you know, just to compete against the guys that I had to compete against on a nightly basis back in the nineties. Uh, it, it was, it was a treat. I mean, you think about 450 guys basically in the world were in the NBA and I was one of them. And, uh, as you get out of the game, you know, when you're, when you're playing, you want to be the best and you think you should be the playing more or doing this or doing that. And then you step back and say, you know, I was one of one hundred, one of four hundred and fifty guys that were in the NBA in the world, and you know, people criticize. I just hear Monday morning quarterbacks when you're, you know, when I'm here around the grill at the club, and oh, that guy stinks, and he stinks, and he, well, he's one of four hundred fifty guys that's doing that job, so he can't be that bad. So you get an appreciation of guys that make it because I do know how hard it is. Uh, Milwaukee, Golden State, Atlanta. L.A., Sacramento, Detroit, Denver, Atlanta again, Houston. Favorite city to play in? Well, that's tough. Um, I had some – I mean, Sacramento is kind of where I arrived. Um, started in Milwaukee, didn't get much of an opportunity there. Uh, played a little bit in Golden State, then I didn't get any opportunity in L.A. And then I got to Sacramento and Rick Adelman uh, when we brought in Jason Williams and Chris Weber and Vlade Divac and Peja Stojakovic. It was just kind of a, they had no idea what was going to happen. And we struck lightning in a bottle and became one of the most exciting teams in the league. And I got a chance to be a part of the, of the bench and played, you know, over 20 minutes a night. And that's kind of where my career started. So Sacramento, very dear to me, uh, loved playing in Houston, uh, had my, probably my best statistical years in Detroit. Uh, but, you know, I met great, great people everywhere, every stop that I made. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago on this show, we spoke to Jason Williams and, uh, you know, as a kid who grew up in the nineties, I don't know if there was anyone cooler than white chocolate, right? Like we, especially as uh, honestly, as a white kid, like I tried to emulate him, right? Like he was just the quint. it was like him and Eminem that we looked up to, right? Could you tell me what it was like just being a part of that, that crew? Because the whole squad was just so cool. The cowboy, everything about it just seemed cool. Yeah, it was it was amazing how it came together. I mean, Jeff Petrie was our GM, who was a great player back in the day with Portland. Uh, Rick Adelman, great coach at Portland, had just come over, and we I, I don't think they really had any idea what was going to happen. Uh, mm. We bring in those guys I mentioned. Chris Weber gets traded. Chris Weber uh, initially had no desire to be in Sacramento. He's kind of a big city guy coming from D.C. and uh, Vlade came in and Peja was a great draft pick. And then Hito Turkoglu eventually, uh, Jay Will. Um, it was amazing. I mean, we, we, we got to camp. I remember flying out there. My son was just born and I had a non-guaranteed contract. And let me tell you, a non-guaranteed contract in the NBA is not a lot of fun. You, you go there and 
you have to beg a coach to talk to you because they have nothing vested in you. You're just there trying to make a team. And I'm not saying they disrespect you or anything, but they're dealing with their guys that they're paying because those are the guys that they need to play well. Uh, so anyway, I had a non-guarantee contract and I get on my flight from Atlanta and Vern Maxwell's on my flight. And I'm like, oh, geez. I, I mean, great. Vern was a great NBA player in my estimation. So I had no idea he was one of the guys that was trying out for the team. He had a non-guaranteed deal, too. We had eight two guards there for two spots. And Vern's on my flight. So I'm like, well, we probably got seven people for one spot now because I'm going to assume Vern Maxwell's in there. So uh, I, I don't know. I just remember getting out there and just – totally focusing in and having, you know, one of my best camps ever and, and wind up making the team along with Vern. It was me and Vern and uh, just, it was magic from them. Sacramento is an unbelievable basketball town. Their, their fans are second to none. And uh, we just, we had a ball. And, you know, I, I, I read those cities that you played in and you kind of laughed. I wasn't trying to, you know, accentuate the fact that you played for a lot of teams, but what's interesting about that is, uh, you you weren't traded often. It was a lot of free agent deals. You were yeah. traded from Sacramento. When you got the call that you were being traded to Detroit, considering mm -hmm. the special feeling surrounding that team, can you tell me what that felt like some 22 years ago? Yeah, that was brutal. Um, I was on the ninth hole of a golf course about an hour and a half from Atlanta. And uh, I remember somebody came driving out, some a couple of the pros in a uh, golf cart, and they're like, yeah, Mr. Barry's emergency. You got to call your wife. I was married at the time. And so I call and my wife is crying and I'm like, what, what's going on? So I'm thinking something happened to my sons or something. She's like, you got traded. I'm like, what you got? And I'm like, where? And she goes, Detroit. And I just dropped the phone uh -huh. and I was like devastated. I mean, Sacramento, which I grew up an hour and a half from there. So I had tons of friends, family, uh, and Detroit was terrible. They had one, I think, 28 games the year before and i remember it, it it ruined my back nine let's just put it that way i wasn't i wasn't too happy um you did end up going to denver afterwards and you were there it's kind of interesting that we're talking now not only because of denver uh making it to the finals for the first time in their history but also because you were there during carmelo anthony's rookie year uh and he just announced his retirement could you tell me what was uh mellow like as a rookie i was at syracuse uh, when they won in 20, um, 2003, I was a student at Syracuse when he was there as well. I was a junior. He was a uh, freshman, of course. What was he like as a as a rookie in that year, 2003, 2004? Uh, well, first of all, he's a man of his word because when he came in, one of the first things he told us was, if we make the playoffs, I'm buying everybody a Rolex. Huh. And we made the playoffs somehow, some way. Uh well, he had a lot to do with it. The guy is, uh, he's just one of those kind of born scorers. I mean, uh, just an incredible ability to score the basketball. Uh, he was a lot more athletic, I think people gave him credit for. Uh, he had a great, like, second jump. If he missed a shot, he could go up and get it again. Really, you know, he was just uh, really good around the basket, strong. And uh, he bought us a Rolex because we made the playoffs somehow. We had a. A bunch of misfits there, too. It was a lot like Sacramento. Uh, Marcus Camby came in. We had Vashawn Leonard, myself, Earl Boykins, Andre Miller, uh, just kind of a posh posh full of guys. And I believe they won 18 games the year before Carmelo's rookie year and then when we came in, and we won 43. Uh, Jeff Pesdelic did a hell of a job with that team, and uh, we got in the playoffs, and a lot, a lot of that had to do with Carmelo Anthony, who was one of the great scorers the league's ever seen. I'm seeing some people this week debate if he's a Hall of Famer. This seems bizarre to me. Yeah. Your take? Top 10 scorer, I, I think you're in. Yeah. I mean, 20 years, I know. I, I think, did he ever make a conference final maybe once? Once, in yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that hurts you. If you don't win a title, I get it. But uh, I, I think it's pretty safe to say. And, and you know what people forget is the Hall of Fame is also based on your college career. True. So he's in. Yeah, he 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 won a call. He you were there. Yeah, he won, and he was the best player on that team. That gets you in the Hall of Fame, in my opinion. I know you were only with him for a season, but you know maybe towards the end of his uh, run with New York, and then afterwards, like he was kind of being branded as a bad teammate. Didn't want to adjust to his his role and his skill set. <clears throat> Did you ever feel like he was a bad teammate? Uh, when I play with him, no. no, no, absolutely not. And 
look, it, it's hard for guys that are star players that are used to scoring uh, upwards to 30 points a game to take a take a backseat role. I mean, that's difficult for them to do. It's like that's what I would wish every star come play off the bench and see what we deal with. Uh, the, the rope is not nearly as long when you come off the bench. You know, if I go 0 for 3, 0 for 4 in my first couple of minutes, that might be it. When you're a starter, you know you're going to get, a, you know, extended minutes and you can get into a slow start, uh, i.e. Jason Tatum. <laughs> if, yeah. if he had a if he had a bench rope, this guy would never be playing because his first quarters have been dreadful. But uh, it, it's tough for a star to do that, you know, at, at the latter part of their career to not get the minutes and not get the rope that they're used to getting. Uh, I apologize if you've been asked this question before. I'm sure you have. First time we speak. Uh, Kobe Bryant, rookie. You're on that Laker team. Second year, for, second year for me with him. Sec yeah, okay. So what, did, what was he like in his early days? Uh, so this was before Kobe became Kobe. Um, I mean, he still played behind Eddie Jones at that time. I think he averaged maybe 17, 18 minutes a night. Uh, that year that I played with him uh, the year before us, I think he had that air ball in Utah in the yes. playoffs. Uh, and, you know, Kobe was as driven a guy as I've ever seen. I said it back then when I played with him that I thought it was the closest thing to Michael Jordan that we'll ever see. Uh, he sat on the plane. He, he rarely spoke. He would write rap music and he would watch Michael Jordan highlights not just basketball highlights, interview highlights. If you notice, he tried to speak like Michael Jordan. Yes. The only thing this guy wanted was to get as many titles and be Michael Jordan. That's it. That's all he wanted. And I remember after practice, we play one-on-one. -on -one, and if I said, if I didn't say I'm leaving, we would stay there until I don't know when. Like he would literally keep playing till midnight. If we had a one o'clock practice, it didn't matter. He That's all he wanted to do was work on his game. I saw nobody work harder. I saw nobody more dedicated to the game than Kobe Bryant. So when you say he's watching the interviews, is he watching to learn or watching to kind of yeah. like emulate the way he speaks? I think emulate the way he speaks. Wow. Yeah. I mean, he, he I remember like some of his celebrations when he go to yes. a knee and like um, he, his mannerisms were very similar to Michael Jordan. That's all he wanted to be. And he wanted to be better than him. I remember we went to Chicago the, uh, the year we were playing him, and, and the guy was like, I, I can't even say a kid in a candy store. I mean, he was, it, it, it was like seeing Santa Claus when you're four years old and you believe in Santa Claus. That, that's what he was. Like, Michael Jordan was Kobe Santa Claus. He would go absolutely bonkers being in his presence. Would you guys rib him? Like, yo, man, you don't need to be watching all this stuff. Like, this is a little bit too obsessive. Were guys making fun of him for that? No. No, we were too busy playing cards on the plane. So he, he, he was just sitting by himself. But I would go, you know, sit next to him at times. And that's what he was doing. I'm telling you, he wanted to be Michael Jordan more than anything in the world. Is there, you, know, you played with so many great players, um, Houston with T-Mac and Yao. Mm -hmm. We talked about Denver and Detroit and LA. Is there one team that you feel like fell short? You're, like the one team that you're like, man, if things would have gone a little differently, if this guy wasn't hurt, if, if we, you know, like that, that, yeah. that one what if team, is there one that sticks out? Well, my my second to last year, uh, Jawan Howard got hurt. We we beat Dallas two two in a row in their barn to start the series. So we were up two up on the road, and Jawan Jawan Howard didn't play in the series, and we were playing great basketball. That was with Yao and McGrady and and Bob Sura and Dave Wesley. Uh, that was disappointing. But like the Sacramento thing, you you already went over it when I got traded. I knew that team was was on an, an uprise, and they traded Jay Will for Mike Bibby the same summer that I got traded. Because mm -hmm. I remember running into Jeff Petrie when we got Mike Bibby, and I was like, wow, this is something. I mean, no disrespect to Jason Williams, but Mike Bibby at the time was an all-star caliber player, and I knew that that was going to be an unbelievable deal. So I got excited, and then I get a call you know, a month later that I'm gone. So that hurt because I had some very deep relationships with guys and I knew that team and we know how close they were. Game seven with the Lakers, uh, they had some opportunities. Uh, they didn't get it done. And I know that if I was there, I, I, I would have had an opportunity maybe to help and that would have been incredible for me. But again, and then Detroit, you know, I, I was a free agent. They won the year after I left. So addition by subtraction, uh, apparently. But I had two good years there and then missing that championship year 
uh, was a bit painful. Very happy for all my guys that were on that team, but uh, I just missed a, a championship there, so that hurt. When did you start to think about TV work, about media work? When did that like start to percolate in your brain? Uh, probably three or four years before I retired. Okay. Uh, you know, every every time we had a game on national TV, I'd make a point to go say hello to the announcers, meet the producers, and just kind of get you know get my name in there and. A lot of guys at ESPN helped me out. I, I remember, you know, Mike Breen, one of the best in the business. Uh, you know, he he had mentioned my name to ESPN, and Dave Pash is one of my great friends now. And these guys, you know, if you just you got to get your name out there. And I, and I knew that was something I wanted to do since the eighth grade. Uh, the NBA got in the way. I didn't think I'd play in the NBA, but uh, I was fortunate enough that ESPN gave me an opportunity and got to do it for fourteen years. Wait, originally you wanted to be a broadcaster before a player. Well, yeah, in eighth grade, I did a, in a speech class, I did a, a, a sports cast. So I just set up a, a camera and I did like a nightly three minute, you know, sports cast. And I wow. did all the writing and all that. And my teacher gave me like the perfect score. And I was like, I, I didn't like school. And this was the only thing that I ever did well. And she's like, you should really think about getting into this business. And I remembered it. And it was something that I always wanted to do. Is that something when you retire, like, do they send you to a school of some sorts or like a seminar or do, do you just transition right from playing to on air? Yeah, you go right on. I mean, I actually, my when I went up to ESPN for the first time, I did ESPN News and I thought it was just like a, a dry run, like you said. Like, and my buddy calls me and goes, oh, you got the job at ESPN? I go, what are you talking about? He goes, I just saw you on ESPN uh -huh. News. I'm like, I swear I thought that was like, just a dry run to see how you did. You know, thankfully I didn't curse or I might not have ever had a job. Uh, what What do you think of the current state of NBA broadcasting slash journalism? Uh, I'm not going to name names. I, I think there's a lot of uh, mediocrity out there. There's a lot of guys I love. Uh, my, my biggest problem is, you know, where's the, where's the decorum and like, you know, you if you work for ESPN or Fox or TNT, like you, you represent that company as a whole. And to see some of the way these guys act, getting into Twitter fights with players, uh, going on the floor and picking fights with players, uh, cursing and, you know, just being inappropriate. Uh, a lot of guys, it, 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 there's too big of a rope for that. I, I just think there should be more professionalism. Uh, off the off the uh, off the field, you know. Uh, I, I don't understand how guys get away with that because I, you know, back when I started, and that was only you know 16 years ago, uh, that was very important. I, I think if you did something that, you know, shed some uh, a black eye on on your company that you work for, you you, you to potentially be gone. And uh, that's not the case now. I think it's more like, hey, we just want more attention to you. Whatever happens is is kind of good for the business, and uh, I, I don't really like that. You can't you can't get into to fights with players and and do these types of things. I I just I don't understand. Why do you think ESPN has never been able to get really close to TNT in terms of the the studio team? They've tried so many different you know variations, yeah. and TNT has had the same crew just adding Shaq, you know, but that was it. Why yeah. do you think they've been able never been able to figure it out? Charles Barkley. I mean, yeah. there's no, there's only one Charles Barkley because uh, he makes that show, and if he's off that show, that show's not nearly as watchable. And mm. and, and and look, Ernie Johnson's unbelievable host. I mean, he keeps the reins on these guys, and he he's brilliant. Uh, but it's just Charles, man, and they have fun. They're 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 uh, it's like a variety show. It's not look if you if you want to go get into X's and O's and really find out about basketball, that's not the show for you. It really isn't, but it's just, it's an entertaining show. And, and I think ESPN is, it, they're too serious. Uh, we were always going by script because I did that show for six yeah. years with Magic Johnson and Mike Wilbon and, and, and Stuart Scott. Um, they, too scripted, you know, Hey, we're going to go on the a block. This is what we're doing. We got to get this. And we got it. It's like, these guys, just they have fun. Like I saw Shaq was like late and they started the show and they just, <laughs> And bring them in. Like ESPN would go absolutely bonkers. If a guy was late and he didn't show up, I mean, they'd freak out. And TNT's just like, hey, man, it's regular life stuff. Let's roll with it. And they and they have a great time. And 
And it really, really is entertaining to watch. I'm putting you a bit on the spot here, but just curious, like ultimate three man booth plus a sideline reporter. You could take oh, current that I could work with. You could work with, yeah. What's the ultimate? It could be well, current. It's very difficult. Past. I mean, I, I'll do it with guys that I haven't worked with because right. I, I've gotten a chance with Mike Brain Day Pash, Mike Tarico. I mean, these guys are these guys are incredible. Uh, I like Ian Eagle. Love him. I never worked with Ian. I think he's a great guy. Uh, his son does a good job too, but Ian is, I think Ian's the best. I would love to work with Ian and uh sideline reporter. Does it have to be an NBA sideline reporter? No, go ahead. I go with Melanie Collins just because I think she's hot. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. <laughs> I appreciate the honesty. I appreciate it. You've never done, did you do sideline once? I think you, uh, didn't you and Dave one time I, do flip a coin yeah. to see who would interview uh, Greg Popovich, Pop. right? Yeah. I did, I did pop. So I, I think I said something like, so where'd you eat last night? And, Cause I think we were in New York maybe or something. And uh, he said some Italian and I said, all right, did you go Merlot or cab? And that That's was good. it. Yeah. I'm sure he appreciated that. I love it. Uh, okay. Very last thing, because you're keeping it real here. I was, I was debating with the Showtime guys it was uh, Steven Jackson, Paul Pierce, and Boogie Cousins. Who would you rather have on your team, Jamal Murray or Drew Holiday? I said Jamal Murray. They all said I was crazy. They all said Drew Holiday. Who's right now? Well, I, I don't think you're crazy at all. Uh, I think they're totally different players. Yeah. I mean, Jamal Murray is offensively far more gifted than Drew Holiday. Uh, I, I, and I love Drew Holiday. It's like, I hate when we have to say, who do you like? That means you hate the other guy. No, no, no. It's not the case. You, you know, no, but everybody one. does that. It's like, yeah. oh, I think Joker's better than him. Uh, whatever. Uh, different players. Drew Holiday, great defensive player. But Murray, man, that guy's on fire. And they're, they're different. You know, Drew Holiday, much better defensively than Murray. Murray's much better offensively. So it depends on what team I have. If I have a bunch of great defense around me, give me Jamal Murray. If my defense stinks... I'll take Drew Holiday. This was a lot of fun. Thank you, John. I really appreciate it. Good luck out there. Uh, I hope you beat Chandler Parsons and take all his money. All right. I appreciate it. Good to be with you. Thank you so much for watching this episode of the Ariel Hawani Show. If you want to check out some of our old episodes or if you want to stay up to date with all the great things that we are doing here, please do like and subscribe to this year page. Trust me, some really cool things are coming up.